So I'm telling you I don't believe there's a God. And yeah. your, your response to that is, I really do because I have a moral sense. But my moral sense is utterly without any appeal to a God. Explicitly. Or implicitly. Uh, maybe. The f That's not so obvious. Okay, it's really See, because it's, it's you, regard, easy. you regard Sam Harris as an implicitly valuable entity, because otherwise you'd just throw him off the stage. And then the question is, well, just exactly why is he an implicitly valuable entity? I don't What's think your he's, metaphysics of that? I don't think he's implicitly valuable in the sense... <laughs> in the... Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Matt Dolhady. Uh, for 13 years, I've hosted the Atheist Experience TV show out of Austin, Texas, along with lectures and debates and other stuff. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jordan Peterson. How are you? Ready to go. All right. <laughs> well, there were people who came and were like, oh, you, I thought it would be nice if we started with something quick and easy and simple, like God. <laughs> uh, in particular, I, I don't believe there is one, and I have no idea what your thoughts are on it. You mean on the fact that you don't believe there is one? Uh. <laughs> I mean just about the subject in general, but I'm happy to hear your thoughts on about what I don't think is, well, maybe. Well, it's a complicated problem, and I don't think that we take it with due seriousness. I specifically don't think that the celebrity atheist types, who I actually have a fair bit of respect for, by the way, take it with due seriousness. So I don't think that they take it with due seriousness from a biological perspective or a phenomenological perspective or a literary perspective or a metaphoric perspective. That'll do for starters. So one of the issues that, that I have, and, and you can respond to this, is that the, the let's say, the celebrity atheist types, because I actually like that phrase, um, <laughs> they don't seem to me to be contending with the real issues. They what, seem what to are be the going real issues? Dostoevsky, he's a real issue. Tolstoy, he's a real issue. Carl Jung, 20 books and maybe 15 seminars. He's a real issue. Mircea Eliade. Like, there are some serious heavy hitters in the religious phenomenology domain. And my sense so far, I just finished reading all of Harris's books, for example, is he doesn't contend with them at all. And it's like, for me, that's like being an evolutionary biologist and not being aware of Darwin. It's actually a big problem. And, and the know? fact that we, yeah. we can be, you know, before we had a good understanding, we still don't have a good understanding of, of death and the mind and stuff. But if I'm standing here talking to you and I drop over dead, there's a clear, undeniable difference in me sitting here as an animated being and me laying there as no longer there. And so it seems a natural inference that something that about me has left. That doesn't mean that there's actually something about me, like a soul or whatever that's left. It, you know, we don't tend to think the same thing when the radio stops working or the, or the television stops working. It's not like the man in the TV has left. It's just off. But it seems that those sorts of natural... I don't know if you natural... want to use that analogy because it suggests that whatever's in the TV is coming from an external source. And you're definitely not making that argument with regards to the soul. Well, the TV you station I mean? isn't in my living room, so there's at least some external source sending it right, to Right, but that's exactly my point. Yeah, that's all that I was you going You can make a case that consciousness isn't exactly in your head either, even though it's localized there. I had, so why would I think consciousness is anywhere other than my head? Well, how do you account for consciousness? Well, I'm not sure that we can account for consciousness. This is definitely true. But yes. <laughs> See, and that's I have another no reason real, to think well, that's that it's beyond you know, what the brain produces. The fact that something's mysterious doesn't mean that, well, if, consciousness if something's mysterious... Isn't, consciousness isn't just mysterious. It's like really mysterious. It's, it's, it's the most mysterious thing. Okay, well, right? the it's, fact not, that, it's not like ordinary mysterious. The fact that something is really mysterious to the point where I think you and I would agree that we don't have an explanation for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if there was something like that, we'll, we'll say that it's maybe consciousness. We agree we don't have an explanation or at least a complete one for consciousness. Or even a partial one. Okay, I sure. So, it seems vaguely so associated consciousness with the is brain. really mysterious and you and I have no explanation for it. As human beings, we're uncomfortable with saying, I don't know. This is something I'm trying to teach people to become more comfortable with, is to say, I don't know. 
And so when you ask me about consciousness, my answer is, I don't know. But for other people, they're so uncomfortable with I don't know that they posit an explanation that they cannot justify, something that's untestable and unfalsifiable, and that is that there's a ghost in the machine. Hmm. I can't make that leap because there's, it, 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 is, it is entirely speculation without support. It seems intuitively right because of how we view the world. And yet, I would rather say, I don't know, and then continue to explore it, because I, I worry that by asserting what the explanation is, you stop looking for the actual explanation. So let, let, me, let me ask you something. We'll get back to that, maybe. So the way consciousness appears to me is that it's a faculty, let's say, that confronts possibility. We call that possibility, well, sometimes possibility, sometimes we call it potential, like your potential. Sometimes we call it the future. So I don't see us as driven deterministically like clocks, which is apparently, I think, although I've been accused of misunderstanding Sam Harris before, but I think that's the, that's the argument that he makes. I see us instead as agents confronting a landscape of possibility. And that what consciousness does is enable us to shape that possibility into actuality. And we do that with whatever it is that allows us to make decisions. I think that our legal system is basically predicated on the idea that that's true. I think that if you treat yourself that way, that works. I think if you treat other people as if that's their basic characteristic and perhaps their value, that you get along with them. And I think that if you organize your society on that presupposition, it appears to be functional. So, so what do you think about the idea of consciousness as confronting a landscape of possibility or potential? It, it there's a number of different ways to, to frame these things so that people can have a better grasp on it. One of the things I know people struggle with is, and we may have to get back to this in a minute, I don't necessarily want to dig in on it just a second, but I would love to talk about it. Um, this idea that absent a God, there's no moral authority. This is a fear that many people have. And when you're talking about viewing consciousness as the way, the way you describe consciousness is, is what I would probably call our agency. Okay. And while I don't think that we have libertarian free will, I'm on record as being a compatibilist along with Dan Dennett. Um, but I also had a re another discussion recently, so I'm going to clarify it because of that discussion. Sam and I had a, Sam Harris and I had an argument in Chicago about free will, and uh, I was pointing out that uh, he could walk over and step off the end of the stage or I could pick him up and carry him and drop him off the stage, and at the end, the, the effect would essentially be the same. But the conflict between those two is everything that I describe as will. Whether you want to call it free or not, uh, I think it, that's, what, that's what we value. That's what we care about. That's, I would be responsible for that action. I would be acting in opposition to what the other agent wanted. And I don't know that you have to... And there would be something hypothetically wrong about that. Yes. Okay, okay, good. See, there's a difference between thinking something and believing it, because to believe it, it has to be thought incarnated in sure, some for, sense. It has me, to be embodied. When I, when I talk about it, belief is the state of being convinced that a proposition is true or likely true. It's every, everything that I try to do, uh, I, I tend to view in the form of propositional reasoning. Um, so when we talk about the narrative... Yeah, that's a problem, by the way. Okay. Yeah, well, it's, you can't reduce the world to a set of propositions. Why not? Oh, Look, uh, uh, show me something that is no true problem. in the world that is not a proposition. That, like that you an explicit, put in the, statable proposition? Something that is demonstrably true that I could not put in a proposition. Oh, that's, that's easy. Okay. You sure you want to go there? I'm not afraid of anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I'm wrong, I want to know I'm wrong. But I, I, yeah. I'm trying to, for years I had this thing going where people would say, oh, and this is kind of what we're getting at from a different angle. I would say they would be afraid of what we would lose if we lost religion. And I basically said, demonstrate to me any th benefit. Oh, you'd lose art and poetry and drama and narrative why, and story. Why? Are, there, are there no godless artists and poets? Well, there are artists and poets who think they're godless. <laughs> so we might have crossed over into a problem area because yeah, no doubt. I, I don't actually... I can't draw for crap, although I do draw during the show. Um, but 
one of the individuals who came to the show the other night handed me something that she had spent a great deal of time drawing. She's a wonderful artist. I'm very grateful to get it. And um, I actually don't believe in a God. And I could write poetry. But you act poetry. like you do. Huh? But you, you act like you do. That's why you didn't I want to throw like Sam off the stage. No, now you're making a claim. Okay, so I'm telling you I don't believe there's a God. And yeah. your, your response to that is, I really do because I have a moral sense. But my moral sense is utterly without any appeal to a God. Explicitly. Or implicitly. Uh, maybe. The f That's not so obvious. Okay, it's really because it's you easy. regard you regard Sam Harris as an implicitly valuable entity, because otherwise you'd just throw him off the stage. And then the question is, well, just exactly why is he an implicitly valuable entity? I don't What's think your he's, metaphysics of that. I don't think he's implicitly valuable in the sense, <laughs> in the. <laughs> I don't think he's I don't think he's implicitly valuable in the sense that the universe has in, 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 implied that there's something. Explicit about it. For me, morality is, is far simpler than some people. Now wait, you sounded doubtful about that. You know that like maybe you're sounded, the mind reader. You've been, I, well, you well maybe <laughs> because you've already you've already suggested that despite me sitting here and having talked about this for decades uh, that I don't believe in God that I actually do because I have a moral code. But my moral code, which I've well, I was more about, specific. I, I said it was because you didn't want to throw Sam off the stage. Yes, it wasn't but just you that didn't you, had you a moral didn't code. remote you didn't even attempt to ask me why I didn't throw Sam off the stage. Instead, you went to, why do you think has, Sam has implicit value? Because it okay, seems so, that okay, in your narrative, I'm, I'm willing that's to go the there. only justification. Well, I okay. think you can have a per perfectly acceptable foundation for secular morality, even if it fundamentally centers around selfishness. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not be thrown off the stage. It's in my best interest to encourage that sort of understanding in others, and therefore, I will not throw him off the stage. I would rather not have my stuff stolen, and it's in my best interest to encourage others not to do that, so I will not steal stuff, and I will work with others to ensure that the people who steal stuff are punished. It is in, in, a, in a virtually pragmatic uh, why moral do you, system. Why do you think it's not in your best interest to have stuff stolen from you or to be thrown off the stage? Why is it not in my best interest? Yeah. No, no, you, know, you, don't, you don't get to think, oh, that's self-evident. It's like nothing self-evident to the skeptic. Let's keep that in mind. Oh. Well, so... Because uh, if we're going to get skeptical here, we might so, as well go all the way so, to the bottom. So for, for, for Sam and I, the foundations, and we're not the only ones, but I, I tend to reference Sam just because if I say this, then somebody will say, well, that's exactly what Sam Harris says, except that, you know, I was given this lecture before he wrote his book. But, uh, <laughs> but his book is better than my lecture, so read his book. When I talk about this, I'm talking about well-being is the language that Sam uses. Oh, I don't, yeah. I don't, Sad. I don't care whether or not somebody else considers that morality. At, I would think at a minimum, would you and I agree that... That whole well-being thing, man, as a basis for a metaphysics, that's just a non We're not basing metaphysics on it. If Sam is. No, he's not. Yes, he is, because he's out well, to maximize you can, well-being. You can take it up with Sam. Well, okay, sorry. Do you, th you think I'm wrong about that claim? I, that's what I understood I from I don't think Sam's him. saying anything metaphysical about it. I think, so here's the thing. We are physical beings. Well, it's his fundamental claim. So it's sort of at the basis of his ethic. And so he says, well, we should work to maximize people's well-being, or at least to, well, he does a bit more than that, because he not, says we should so minimize not, their suffering. He's not maximize, minimize in, in this sense of sens simple consequentialism. Let me do this. Okay. We're physical beings in a physical universe, and the laws that dictate how things work in the universe, they are the ultimate arbiters of what is or isn't in our best interest, whether we know it or not. So, for example, so far as I can tell... Then why do you need free will? I don't, I don't think Why do you believe in will. it, then? I, why, do you, why do you attribute agency to things if the laws of the can universe I can... Can get to that one point? Well, yeah, but there was a contradiction that was free will confusing isn't, me. Free will isn't relevant to this. It is if the laws of the universe are what are dictating what's good for us.